Okay, thank you for inviting me to give this speech about the comparisons between cattle and horse. I think Reinhardt has covered quite a lot of it already, and there will be also some repetitions with what Catherine and uh, Forza has mentioned previously. And I think also after my speech, there will be a couple of presentations where they have been trying out in practice the international evaluations in a couple of projects. I'll talk about the parallels and differences between the horse and cattle industries, as was envisaged for me, and related to the opportunities for international genetic evaluations. And since I have one foot in each one of those species' work, I think I can make some of the, those comparisons needed. I'll try to pick up ten points for discussion about the comparison between the two species about globalization, organization of the industries, breeding objectives and recording of traits for selection, the heritability issues about those traits that we desire to improve in our breedings, and genetic evaluation methods and data used as well. The status of the national genetic evaluations for sport horses and what it means for what we need to do. And also go into a little more about the definition of international genetic evaluations. It may not be what you think. And also discuss a little about the vision and experiences of Interstallion since we started those activities more than 20 years ago. I'll pick up specific issues related to the international evaluations of sport horses that might be important that we discuss. And I'll try to put out uh, some steps towards international genetic evaluations of sport horses at the end that can serve as a starting point for the discussion of tomorrow. You see that I have four pictures also here. Different breeds, I think, is what the first ones is. They're found all over the world, more or less. This Holstein cow is found all over the world. You can see that on the black signs of it. North America, <laughs> South America, Europe, and so on. You find her everywhere. And that's why we had to start with the Holsteins, because they were spread most over the world. The dressage horse has a Swiss flag on the Voilock, and it's Christine Stuckelberg riding the horse Gauguin de Lully, if you remember that one as the top horse in dressage. It was born in Switzerland, but it was made in Sweden. So it's a total Swedish pedigree. And the one to the right is Robin Zett. He was born at Sangerscheide. He has a Hanoverian stud book number. He's a cross between Holstein, saint Francais, and, France and uh, Hanoverians. So it clearly demonstrates the globalization that we'll be talking about. The international trade of live animals, that has been a common practice in all species for a long, long time. But the use of artificial insemination and the development of methods for conservation of the semen that really started the globalization of breeding with many species. And uh, in cattle breeding, they were ahead of all other species when it comes to artificial insemination. Maybe not as the first experiment, but uh, for practical use. And that's due to biological and technological reasons. Uh, it's easy to freeze the semen out of bulls, much more complicated with the stallions. A bull can, you can produce maybe 500 to 1,000 doses of semen out of one ejaculate, maybe 510 with many of, of the stallions. And then when you come to the heat period of the cow, the cow's heat period is less than 48 hours, so you can easily hit the right time of insemination much easier than you can do with the horse. And dairy cattle today, it's 100% frozen semen, more or less. An extensive international trade of semen all around the world. And some bulls have more than a thousand sons being breeding bulls in different AI studs around the world. In sport horse breeding, it has been more common with 
artificial insemination primarily during the 70s and later. But it was with fresh semen where you had the mare at the same place as you had the stallion. So it took some time before methods were developed where you can transport semen much more easily than you can do, could do before. But the use of frozen semen is much less efficient than it is with full semen. So that's why it was developed the method of transporting fresh chilled semen and that has been a successful way of handling it in horse breeding. And we can see that uh, superior sport horse stallions that have been used in breeding, they have many progeny spread around the world. They can be live exported horses, but mostly today results from imported semen. You find a lot of that. If we talk a little about the organization of the industries, I think Reinhard had mentioned quite a lot of that, but the cattle industries are mostly based on farmer-owned large herds of cows, maybe as low as 20 cows, but you have herds that are more than a thousand cows, and that makes a big difference, and they are all for commercial production. Farmers are organized in cooperatives for record keeping, for processing and marketing of the products as well. And all records have been digitized since long and used for advisory services as well as for genetic evaluations, not just for genetic evaluations. And AI studs, they are both privately and cooperatively owned and operate globally in very competitive market. And farmer cooperatives or government organizations, depending on what country we're talking about, they are usually responsible for the calculation of breeding values and there are some EU mandates of that in Europe. When we look upon the sport horse situation, sport horse breeders are mostly small scale breeders. <coughs> some are commercial, but many are hobby breeders. And we heard one figure from the Cell Francais, 1.7 mares per breeder. And that's typical for what it is in most countries. Sport breeders are organized in breed societies, as you all know, the stud books with registration mandates of EU and Europe. And it may be different in other parts of the world. Stallions are usually privately owned. Some of them are found at the state studs. And the owners are responsible for semen distribution. It's a competitive international market for top horses. Riders and trainers are heavily involved in training and selling horses. But there are local markets available for what we could call normal horses, all the rest, for hobby riders or whatever you would call them. Some of them are professionals as well. And sport horse breeding, I think, is much more sensitive to economic fluctuations in the society than the commercially strong dairy industry. When we talk about breeding objectives and records used for selection, I think Reinhardt laid it out very well with milk production, milk composition, growth rate, health, fertility, conformation, and so on. And a majority of the traits are subjectively scored, in fact. And reporting is done through milk recording schemes or AI and health records, conformation evaluation schemes, and so on. And also with robot milking systems, they have sensors that can measure ease of milking, temperament of the cow, and so on. Traits selected for are usually sex limited for biological reasons. We can't milk a bull. So we have to measure all the traits in cows, more or less. With beef traits, it is different, both sexes. But the traits are expressed rather early in life. The cows or heifers calve usually when they are two years of age, and that's rather young age compared to what it is for horse. So progeny testing has historically been important for estimation of breeding values, and that's the main reason for the enormous genetic progress that has been made for the last 30, 40 years in uh, cattle breeding. But uh, nowadays, genomic selection is a common practice also in the large dairy breeds but it requires that you have a basic system of 
genetic evaluation on the national basis or international basis to be able to benefit from the genomic evaluations and especially it's designed for the larger populations. If we look upon the sport or situation, equestrian sport is globalized according to FEI rules for classification of competition and results of different disciplines. And dressage and show jumping are the most important traits or sports that we select for. Traits are in contrast to the cow situation expressed in both sexes. Both males and females compete. Both can be judged for confirmation, gates, and so on. But as far as competition results, they appear rather late in life, with an optimum at about 10 to 15 years of age of the horses. So that makes a difference. And that's also the reason why performance tests for jumping ability, evaluation of gates, rideability, and so on have been developed for young horses. And young horse tests have a very specific role to play in horse breeding, and they are practiced also in many stud book systems. I'm turning to the heritability of important traits and give some examples of that. It was emphasized by both Orsa and uh, Reinhardt about the heritabilities that we find in dairy cattle. We have enough information also in the horse industry about what the heritability is for a number of important traits. But for dairy cattle, we can see that most traits are related to values between 20 and 50 percent. 50 percent for the more objective traits that you can measure, and especially uh, some traits with large variation. But there's not one figure that we have. It's depending on how you record them. And you can record the traits very different with objective measures sometimes and subjective judging in other cases. But you can also see at the bottom of the table for other health, female fertility, calving ease, and so on, heritabilities are lower. But that doesn't mean that you can't do anything because they have a large genetic variation anyway. And there's so many other, other factors that influence the results. And they are, as far as health traits, usually you have to distinguish between a healthy cow or a sick cow. There's nothing in between, not half sick. Some other traits may be measured, like somatic cell counts and so on, that can measure a little about the process of the, or the dynamics of the disease as well. But that's a general picture of the heritabilities that you find in most studies of dairy cattle. But as I said, we have also examples in the horse breeding. Lots of data have been analyzed in a number of countries. And if we look upon conformation with the height, gates at hand, free jumping, show jumping, competition, dressage competition, we see heritabilities of the same range as we have for dairy cattle. There's no difference. And that's an important message to the horse industry that we do have opportunities. <coughs> I should also mention, as far as genetic correlations, I didn't go into that into any detail otherwise, but show jumping and dressage traits are largely uncorrelated, which means that you can find good jumping horses without being poor in dressage, and also good dressage horses without being poor in, in jumping. But it may depend on the breed, how the breeding program has been exercised and so on. So if I try to summarize a little about the comparison of the cattle and sport horse industries, both cattle and horse breeding is globalized based on massive use of artificial insemination and use of AI across countries of the same individuals. The cattle industry is totally commercialized and based on large herds. Sport horse breeding is a mix of commercial and hobby interests. Dairy farmers organize in cooperatives, including processing and marketing of products. The horse breed societies, at least within EU, have a mandate of the registrations, which is regulated. But there is a split market between the international sport horses for top riders versus the local market of what I call the normal horses, 
that are left for the hobby riders. Breeding objectives vary, of course, but relevant traits are usually recorded similarly across countries. Maybe not exactly done in the same way between the countries, but in a similar way, similar enough that you can make use of it in an efficient way. And that's the same with the horse organizations and what they are recording. And the competition system is regulated by international rules, so it's more easy to get harmonized situation as far as the traits that are recorded. Dairy cattle traits are sex limited and recorded early in life. Project testing of bulls is historically important. Performance in both sexes of horses and young horse tests are important for selection of talents for both the sport and for breeding purposes. And heritabilities, they vary depending on the recording scheme, how accurate you have been in the recording of the traits. But they are of equal size in the two species. And they are sufficient for successful selection results in both cattle and horse breeding. And we know also that we have had big genetic progress, not only in cattle breeding, but in horse breeding. It's definitely not the same horses we see today as we did 30 years ago. So there are important similarities, but also some differences to consider when designing genetic evaluation systems and breeding programs for the two species. If we talk about the genetic evaluations and data used, it was mentioned that uh, estimation of breeding values according to the Blup animal model is used in a number of species, in practically all species where they have genetic evaluations, they use this methodology, and it works for quantitative phenotypic data, like milk yield in cows and young horse test results or competition records, it's tested. <coughs> the method considers all pedigree information available and adjusts for non-random matings or non-genetic effects that are considered as well. <coughs> Those that we can identify, like season, age, birth year, and a couple of other things as well, of course. The method assumes no selection among the animals that you are testing. You should have a random sample to get the normal variation of data included. But the method is rather robust when you have deviations <coughs> from the normality. And ABVs, they are published in different ways in different countries, but in relation to some kind of defined national base could be, for instance, birth year, and you call that base a reference population, and you usually set that to 100 or zero, depending on what country you're working in. But 100 in one country is not the same as 100 in another country. We have different definitions of the basis, and that you have to be careful about. And I think that's what treat, cheated a lot of dairy cattle breeders 30 years ago. They didn't understand that the base was different. They thought that 110 in one country was the same as 110 in another country. But a country that uses a base that goes back 30, 40 years have all positive individuals because of the genetic progress. So how the base is defined is very important. It's the same issue for cattle and the horse situation. Main stud books have national genetic evaluations based on blood and data on young horse tests and or competition data. Several smaller stud books have phenotypic sport data, either from young horse tests or competitions, but they don't have developed their genetic evaluation system yet. But that's what we are discuss will be discussing tomorrow also. What are the opportunities to do that, depending on the level you are from the beginning? There's no too, level, too low level to start from, I would like to say. And national genetic evaluation systems they are based, that are based on competition results, they include progenies of both national stallions and of foreign stallions, mainly results from imported semen, but also partly from horses that have been exported live. But results from international competitions of national riders and their horses are usually available in the national systems. 
So from the international competitions that are available in the national systems, if there is an agreement between the FBI organization, the Federation, and the breed societies. But I have followed it up in the Swedish case, and the Swedish riders, they have their international results independent of if they ride a Swedish horse or the foreign horse. I give an example from Sweden from the national block evaluation of 2018. That's the last one we have. So this is the 15 top stallions with their block values for dressage. And you can see that most of the stallions on the top, they are resulting from semen imports. And it illustrates very clearly what has happened over the last years, or quite many years, I would say, when you have exported semen to a number of countries there are lots of progeny out of foreign stallions and they are evaluated in the evaluation system on the national basis. So there were not more than four Swedish stallions in that group of 15 and all the others were result of semen imports. That was for dressage and I think you recognize most names. And for jumping, the 15 top stallions that have been used in Sweden means that they have progeny in Sweden, mainly, mainly from semen imports. You find also well-known names, and only a minority of them are Swedish horses that have been starting their breeding career in the Swedish studbook system. I think you recognize also those names there. So going from that, which we could call an international evaluation system because you have data out of internationally distributed stallions, but that's not what we mean with the international evaluation system. Globalized breeding means that the same males have progenies in many countries, mainly resulting from export of semen. And it provides a genetic linkages between countries and between stud books because different stud books have progeny out of the same stallions. And it provides an opportunity to estimate the genetic correlations between the countries. So if we don't define the traits exactly the same, we can calculate what is the relationship between the results in one country with another. And that can be done. And then international evaluation system means that a group of countries or stud books cooperate, pooling their national data for joint block evaluations and including then progenies of both national and foreign sires for calculation of international breeding values. So it's not just the issue about using international competition data. It's the use of polling the national systems between a group of countries that are interested in participating in this. And that includes also the international competition data. And the same reasons. You heard from Reinhardt about the cattle situation and in 1983 EAP, IDF and ICAR started Interval as a committee. In 1995 their routine evaluation started. And with the Interstallion Working Group we started that group in 1998 between EAP, ICAR and the World Breeding Federation. And I, since I was active with those issues at that time. I have some slides saved from that time as well. And the visions and experiences of Interstallion emanated from a first discussion in 1997 at an EAP meeting and it was Professor Erich Bruns that had a paper that discussed this. And we found it useful and presented it as an idea for the other organizations. And in 1998, the working group was formed by EAP, World Breeding Federation, and ICAR. And I have a slide from 2001, what the initial aims of the Interstallion project was. And it is a citation from a report that myself and Jan Peterson did at the EAP meeting in 2001 in Budapest. Jan, would you remember this? There were five points. 
proposed procedures to facilitate correct estimation of breeding values for stallions in European countries. Describe the breeding objectives of different warm blood populations in Europe. Describe and review testing schemes and genetic evaluation systems in European countries and find possible ways of, of comparing breeding values across European countries. And finally, have some recommendations for improvements of genetic evaluations. That is from August 2001. <coughs> and what did we do? We organized workshops and meetings, did inquiries to start books, presented reports on possible improvements and developments. There were two PhD students that were engaged and supervised, one by Anne Catherine Ruhlmann from France and Emma from SLU in Sweden on international genetic evaluation systems for competition and young horse test results and were very positive results. It proved it was feasible and we will hear more about that later here from Anna. Later on, a Nordic study was conducted by Siri Furrier from Norway and Orsa Wiklund from Sweden, together with the Nordic stud books, on a project on the international genetic evaluation system. And it really showed a win-win situation of international <coughs> evaluations for all participating stud books. It showed it is feasible. And there were many scientific and popular articles that were published out of the work that was done in those days. But I would like to emphasize that the International Genetic Evaluation System is based on joining National Genetic Evaluation Systems data. EBVs are calculated for all stallions and the results are customized to the scale of each country by considering the genetic correlations if they are not one. If genetic correlations are less than one, rankings will be a little different between, of the stallions between the two countries. If genetic correlations are one, you will get exactly the same ranking between the countries. And data to be used, either phenotypic raw data adjusted for non-genetic factors. You can use young horse test results, for instance, linear profiling data or, so. <coughs> or national EBVs and information on the number of progeny that are behind or relatives that are behind these national EBVs. That's a quicker way of getting it done as it was with Interval and under those circumstances as we operated. An international genetic evaluation system assumes that you have unique ID numbers across countries, for instance the UE Lian system. You have to have a correct identification of both recorded animals and the animals in the pedigrees. And I think this has been the most problematic area in the horse genetic evaluation systems to get pedigree is complete and we have an expression that where you can calculate the pedigree completeness <coughs> the different stud book data and it's very helpful when uh, developing the system. So some specific issues related to uh, international genetic evaluation systems for sport horses. That's this issue about unique numbers across countries. That's a necessity. And utilizing international FEI competition data for results is of course important. This is how to access those and the question to the different country representatives is do results follow the riders reporting to the National Federation organization? At least in Sweden all the riders data are included from their international competitions. And the issue is how to best incorporate the FAE results or the international competition results into the national genetic evaluation systems. There might be different approaches for that. And information on exported horses, I think, is the third issue to be discussed. Data will be lost if export is to a country not participating in the international genetic evaluation system. If they stay within those countries that cooperate, the results will stay there also. But these horses that have been exported, they usually have young horse test results or competition results on the national level before they're exported. At least the more expensive ones, they have shown something before they are exported. 
and the exported horses might cause that they will be double counted if exported horses are included in the IGS. And that is an issue that needs to be investigated, what kind of problem it is. So the steps towards international genetic evaluation systems and sport horses, I laid it out in a couple of points. Investigate, of course, the willingness of stud books with national genetic evaluation systems to join in such a system and a project. Also investigate the interest among stud books that don't have genetic evaluation systems to join another stud book or establishing a system of genetic evaluations on their own using their own raw data. There are different opportunities that will be discussed tomorrow, I think. Make sure that unique ID numbers are used across countries. And there's some genetic analysis to establish the connectedness between the different countries. There's a lot of experience of this, and it doesn't need to be very sophisticated analysis anymore because we have a feeling for what is reasonable there. And you have to establish a way of cooperation for pilot projects. And that's what's going to be discussed as well. And learn from the positive outcomes of the previous projects that we've had in France and in Nordic countries, where they conclude that international jet evaluations are feasible and it is a win-win situation. And with that, I say thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan. It was really interesting to hear.